Questo di routine è mirato a spiegare una tecnica di esagerazione, una tecnica che vede utilizzata le cavi di instabilità di rimaste alta superiore. Essenzialmente la tecnica nasce quando esiste il popolo sulla testa del popolo o sulla cavità di Genevera. Sono le due The topic we will be discussing is traumatic anterior inferior shoulder instability. In traumatic anterior inferior instability, as can be seen in the film clip, there is a lesion, Bankard lesion, of the capsular ligamentous complex in over 95% of the cases, and there may also be bone damage on the humeral head and glenoid. When the bone lesions involve both the humeral head and the glenoid at the same time, we refer to this as a bipolar bone loss lesion. The evolution of lesions of soft tissue has been covered in literature, so it is known that a Bankard lesion can evolve and that there are various kinds, ALPSA and HAGL. On the other hand, little is known of bone lesions following repeated dislocation episodes over time. In deciding whether to treat a patient with a classic arthroscopic repair of a Bankard lesion, that is, a capsular ligamentous repair, or with the repair envisaging a bone support, such as the Latarge technique, it is necessary to consider the bone loss and the poor quality of the soft tissue. These are the decisive factors. To interpret the bone loss and manage to quantify it and understand its role in a possible surgical failure, it is necessary to clarify exactly what is meant by bipolar lesion. In recurrent dislocations, glenoid bone lesions are described in literature as being present in around 86% of cases, Hillsack's lesions in around 94% of cases, and bipolar lesions in 81%. Why is bone tissue important in glenohumeral stability? Bone tissue is particularly important in the mid-range, intermediate stability, in which joint stability is guaranteed by the negative intra-articular pressure and stability ratio, while at the extremes, end range, the stability is supported by the capsular ligamentous complex. Now we'll take a look at glenoid defects and hill sacs lesions. Glenoid defects may be of either the fragment type or the erosion type. The fragment type is usually present in cases where the capsule is strong and of good quality, whereas the erosion type seems to be present if the capsule is weak, where it will elongate and the glenoid rim will be compressed and eroded into a compression fracture. Other authors distinguish the fragment from the erosion type by the fact that the erosion type is not really an erosion caused by chronic fission, but is caused by the compression between the rim and the humeral head. We need to prove this in the future in any case. Our opinion is that in the etiopathogenesis of a fragment type versus an erosion type, a role may also be played by the lesion mechanism. Probably in lesion mechanisms that occur in the abduction and external rotation, the strain of the capsule might create a tear lesion on the bone tissue of the glenoid. On the other hand, in dislocation mechanisms that occur in adduction, the humeral head would be compressed against the glenoid, since the ligaments in this position are loose, so an erosion fracture might be created on the antero-inferior part of the glenoid. How can a glenoid bone defect be identified or calculated? There are various techniques, and we will describe them from the surface area method to the PICO method and so on. On the other hand, Hillsack's lesions, which refer to a bone defect on the posterior surface of the humeral head, can be identified in x-rays and were already described by Malgenia in 1955. Their incidence increases with the number of dislocations, being described in literature as being present in 65 to 67 percent of cases after a first episode and in over 80 percent in recurrent cases. When we speak of Hillsack's lesions, we must keep in mind several parameters that serve to evaluate the importance of this type of lesion. One is the width, and another is the inclination angle with respect to the diaphysial axis and its medial lateral position on the posterior aspect of the humeral head. In any case, glenoid defects and humeral defects must be considered together. 
The first to make this consideration in 2000 was S. Burkhardt, who described Hillsack's lesions as either engaging or non-engaging. Non-engaging lesions are those which, in abduction and external rotation under general anesthesia, before repair of the Bankart lesion, do not engage in the antero-inferior part of the glenoid. On the other hand, engaging lesions are those which, in the same position, before repair of the Bankart lesion, engage in the antero-inferior part of the glenoid, as can be seen in the film clip. In our opinion, as important as this situation is, it is far from a normal one. In fact, what we are interested in is knowing whether the Hillsax lesions engages or doesn't engage after repair of a Bankart lesion. We think all Hillsax lesions are engaging, in the sense that at least once the humeral head has suffered an antero inferior dislocation from the glenoid and created a Hillsax lesion, it is simply a matter of reproducing the degrees on the three levels where the lesion has formed and the amount of stress applied to the humeral head during the dislocation. In conclusion, in our experience, all Hillsax lesions are potentially engaging lesions. The important question is, does it engage after Bankart repair? An interesting study by Kurokawa reports that after a Bankart lesion has been repaired, only 7% are allegedly Hillsack's non-engaging lesions. How can an engaging lesion be distinguished from a non-engaging lesion after a Bankart repair? It is impossible to assay the stability after the Bankart repair on the operating table because this would put the repair just completed in great jeopardy. At the same time, it would not reproduce a realistic situation because the neuromuscular and proprioceptive control apparatus would be absent and the shoulder relaxed by the aqueous solution. To better understand this concept, we need to refer to Itoi's glenoid track. Itoi describes the glenoid track as a contact zone of the glenoid on the humeral head with the arm at the end range of motion and it measures exactly 83% of the glenoid width. In substance, the glenoid tract guarantees the bone stability in the position of abduction and external rotation and measures exactly 83% of the width of the glenoid. GW is the glenoid width and the 83% is the GT, which positioned medially in the footprint of the cuff is the glenoid tract. The position of the Hillsax lesion on the humeral head becomes important along with, in particular, its relationship with the glenoid tract. If the Hillsax lesion is within the glenoid tract, as can be seen in these clips, and we repair the Bankart lesion that was created by the traumatic event, when the patient returns to his sports activity after five to six months, he will have an optimum anatomical situation because the capsidal ligamentous complex has been repaired and the glenoid tract not completely disturbed by the Hillsax lesion guarantees bone stability. We have called these Hillsax lesions on track. On the other hand, off track lesions are the Hillsax lesions which probably depending on the lesion mechanism and number of dislocations located on the most medial aspect completely disturb the glenoid tract. We have thus called these lesions off track, and in these cases, if we were to perform the classic capsular ligamentous repair operation arthroscopically using suture anchors, arthroscopic bank heart repair, when our athlete resumes his sports activity, we will have excessive stress on the repaired capsular ligamentous complex because there is no humeral head bone to support. That is, there is an insufficient glenoid tract, which increases the probability of a surgical failure. Even more interesting is making an assessment together of the bone lesions on the humeral head aspect and glenoid. When there is a glenoid bone loss, the surface of the glenoid tract is clearly reduced. Imagining having this bone defect on the Anfoss view with subtraction of the humeral head we see how the new glenoid tract is smaller, 
since we've had to subtract the glenoid bone loss from the glenoid track. We'll now introduce the concept of on-track and off-track described in 2014 by these three authors. How to assess the bone loss and understand if the remaining bone can handle its stability role. Our example shows only humeral bone loss, but no glenoid bone loss. First step, CT scan of both shoulders and creation of an on foss view of the glenoid. Second step, measurement of the greatest horizontal distance of the glenoid width on both shoulders, which in this case will be the same. It can be seen that in this image, AB is the diameter of the glenoid, and AC is 83% of AB and represents the glenoid track. So we overlay the glenoid track, which is 83% of AB, on a 3D reconstruction of the humeral head with rear view. We situate the glenoid track immediately medial to the footprint of the cuff, and we make our assessment. If the hill sax is in the glenoid track, we call it on track. If instead it is more medial, we call it off track. In the first case, we opt for an arthroscopic bank heart, while in the second case for a latarge procedure. How to assess an on track, off track hill sax in bipolar lesion? The next example is one of humeral bone loss and glenoid bone loss. First step, CT scan of both shoulders and creation of an on foss view of the glenoid. Second step, measurement of the greatest horizontal distance of the glenoid width on both shoulders, which in this case will be different. AB is the diameter of the normal glenoid. CB is the glenoid bone loss. AB1 is the glenoid track of AB, that is, of a normal glenoid. From AB1, we have to subtract CB, which is the bone loss, and thus we obtain the new glenoid track, AL. We overlay on the same 3D CT scan the new glenoid track, which will obviously be smaller, and we assess once again whether the hill sac is inside or outside of the glenoid track. In this case, also, we will have the possibility of an on-track lesion and off-track lesion. Treatment strategies depending on the bipolar bone loss lesion. We consider hill sax lesions either on track or off track according to the criteria just described. Instead, we define the glenoid bone defect as greater or less than 25%, which appears to be the cutoff value as described in literature. When we have an on-track hill sax lesion and a bone loss of less than 25%, which corresponds to the majority of bipolar lesions, around 90%, we opt for an arthroscopic bank heart repair. When we have an on-track hill sax lesion and a bone loss of more than 25%, very rare bipolar lesions, around 5%, we opt for a latarge technique. In glenoid bone losses between 0 and 25 percent, in our opinion, there is in any case a cutoff point, which would be around 13 percent. With this, we would like to say that in on-track lesions with a glenoid bone loss between 0 and 13.5 percent, we can safely opt for an arthroscopic bank heart repair. On the other hand, we should evaluate the situation when we have on-track lesions with glenoid bone losses of more than 13.5%. In literature, a number of different techniques are described to solve these problems. Arthroscopic bank heart repair, open inferior capsular shift, and Latarge procedure. In our experience, when arthroscopic bank heart repair is chosen in cases of major bone loss, there is a risk of having a limitation of the joint in abduction and exterior rotation because the capsuloligamentous complex is repaired on the bone loss and therefore the joint capsule, or rather the capsuloligamentous complex, is put into a state of pretension. In these cases, some authors opt for an open capsular shift while we choose the Latarge technique.
On the other hand, when we have more serious, more medialized Bill Sachs lesions, and we are thus talking about off-track lesions and a glenoid bone loss of less than 25%, arthroscopic bank heart repair is recommended, backed up by the remplissage technique. This consists of an infraspinatus tenedesis in the Hillsax lesion to transform the bone loss of the humeral head for intraarticular and extraarticular and make it impossible for it to engage with the anterior inferior glenoid in the position of abduction and external rotation. As an alternative to this technique, in particular in throwing sports, it is possible to opt for the Latage procedure or the open capsular shift technique. In our experience, this combination of off-track Hillsax lesion and glenoid bone loss of less than 25% involves only 5% of all recurrent antero-inferior instabilities. On the other hand, when we have a medial, therefore off-track lesion of the humeral head and a glenoid bone loss of more than 25%, we recommend the bone support technique Latage. In our experience, these patients account for 2%. Usually, even in off-track lesion, Latage technique is sufficient to restore the length of the glenoid arc. In very rare cases, when the humeral head bone loss is more than 40%, structural allograft or hemiarthroplasty can be used to avoid the engagement of the hill sacs on the transferred coracoid. But once again, they missed the sling effect that prevent the humeral head translation avoiding the engagement.